So, so yeah. th- typically, uh, the, the first question that we ask, if, you, if, if I may, is, you know, it would be great to hear your story. So obviously, I got snippets of it from the book, and I know you've been a counselor since a very long time, but it would be great to get a sense of sort of why you uh, ended up doing what you did, why you ended up writing books, wh- how did it all come about? Okay. okay. All right. right. Basically, um, uh, I started out uh, in uh, taking an English class in college, and I got an F. Uh, so English was not my forte. Um, I was an engineering student, and uh, the very poor grades I got in college, the only thing that prevented me from becoming summa cum laude was my English classes. Okay. And my my teacher thought I was such a horrific writer that I should do something other than write. Okay. So that's where my writing history began. Yeah. Um, but I uh, wrote a lot, and that's a good lesson for people who want to become writers. The 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 point. Is that I didn't start out with a great deal of talent, but I wrote a lot, and every day I wrote something, and I wrote articles, I wrote um, just um, ideas that I had, and um, a lot of the things that I wrote were um, nonsense, foolishness, poor, poorly written, but um, but I got better at writing, and um, in 1994. Or 1984. Uh, by that time, I had written maybe 30 published articles, and I'd actually written a book that was published, but nobody bought. And uh, in 1984, somebody came to me and said they wanted me to publish something that had been written that I wrote. That I that I basically actually I I. I I, I gave it as part of a lecture that was transcribed, yeah. but they wanted to publish it. And I said, sure, go right ahead. And it, that turned out to be his eternity. Okay. And it was uh, a very inauspicious beginning. Very, I mean, just basically I just said, fine, if you, want, if you want to publish this, go right ahead. And um, I was invited to be on the Sally Jesse Raphael show. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. No. But she was a very popular uh, talk show television host and appealed to women. And I got on her show. I was the only man in sight. Uh, In the studio, there were 200 women in the audience. Every camera person was a woman. The person, the people that were on the panel with me were all women. I was the only man in the entire place. And the topic was infidelity. And I wrote in my book, His Eternities, as you know, infidelity is a scourge. It is something to be avoided at all costs. And the other two women that were with me were saying that infidelity was a good idea for women. And so I was the only representative saying it's a bad idea. And when my little talk was over, I got a standing ovation. And Sally raised my book to the TV audience and said, if I had had this book 15 years ago, my life would have been much better than it is today. I recommend that you all read this book. Okay. Okay? No bookstore had my book in it. (laughs) It was basically a book that nobody had ever heard of before. Yeah. But within... Three days, there were orders for over 10,000 books. The publisher only had printed 2,000. And so they went mad. They got madly to work printing books like crazy, getting the books out there. And uh, ever since, the book has sold a minimum of about 100,000 a year, many times more than that. We have over 3.5 million actually sold by now. And it is still selling just about as many books as it sold when it was published back in 1986. And since then, I've written uh, 18 books altogether, and um, none of them are as popular as his returns. And and why? So did uh, so so two questions. One is why his needs, her needs. So why did you pick that? Was it just because you were doing a lot of marital counseling? And two. As a man, how, how did you feel uh, sort of qualified enough to write about her needs? 
Well, well I, I did a lot. I've done, done a lot of marriage counseling. counseling. And uh, so basically, by the time this book came out, I, I was, was operating 34 mental health clinics. Okay. And, uh, and I'm a clinical psychologist, and I became quite good at helping people with their marital problems. And uh, the whole business of, of the needs of men and the needs of women were things that I was spending a great deal of time studying. I did, I did a whole series of, 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 of scientific studies on what men needed and what women needed. I, I, became, uh, I became very, very good at identifying the causes of, of romantic love and what, what creates romantic love. I became an expert at helping people develop romantic love. So out of this background, uh, I wrote what, what became his and eternities. Fantastic. So now, now, you know, my next set of questions is going to be all about, I guess, towards marriage relationships and fidelity as such. So the next one is a big one, which is compared to what it was 30 years ago, we have many, many more live-in relationships, right? We have less people choosing to marry or marriage being pushed later. So I guess the question yep. to you is, first, how important do you think is marriage as an institution, right? And, and in, I guess the simple question is, why should people get married in your view? That's a very, very good question, and um, I address that issue in a book that is coming out this fall called He Wins, She Wins, Okay. Uh, uh, Learning the Art of Marital Negotiation. Okay. And um, I encourage people that are watching this to get a hold of that book, because I think that it is a very important way to understand what's wrong with marriages today. Okay. Uh, the book starts out with the realization that we have had a cultural sea change in the um, industrial world, in, in the first world countries, where we have now made women equal to men. Yes. This is unprecedented in human history. Mm -hmm. uh, women were equal to men first in America in 1920. That's 80 years ago. Well, 90 years ago. But basically what we have is a situation where before 1920, women could not vote. Women could not serve in a public office. Women were not considered to be smart enough to do any of those things. And in marriage, men somewhat, to some extent, owned their wives. Yeah. They owned her. And she had to obey him. In the in the in the um, in 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 the <coughs> vows that my wife Joyce made to me fifty years ago, yeah. she promised to obey me for the rest of her life. Yeah. That was in our wedding vow. Now, fortunately I didn't hold her to it. You know? <laughs> she doesn't she didn't have to obey me for us. And, and, but, and we developed in our relationship a very modern marriage. Uh, a marriage that was successful under the new terms of marriage, which was equality. Now, the, there are a lot of people that are having problems with equality. And, uh, and you begin with men. Men, when they get married, they expect their wives to be somewhat obedient. That isn't happening anymore. We don't have that anymore. <laughs> now, some cultures, it's still, that's still going on. All over the world, you still have women obeying men. Yeah. But not in, in, not in first world cultures. Yeah. Not in first world cultures. We all make women equal to men. Well, that creates a new problem for marriages. And that is that men have to negotiate with their wives. Instead of telling their wives what to do and having her dutifully obey, they've got to come to an agreement. And men don't know how to do that. They don't know how to do it. What they do is they say either they will sacrifice, I'll give you whatever it is you want. Yeah. Sometimes we call that capitulation. Yeah. And she's terribly upset when you don't want her when you don't agree with her, so you agree with her. Yeah. Uh, the second is that you decide that you're going to try to force your will upon her. I call that the dictator approach. Uh, the third approach is what we call dueling dictators, where when your wife finds
trying to do, trying to make her do things, she comes back and tries to make you do things. So it's dueling dictators, okay? And the third is what I call anarchy, where all of a sudden, if you and your wife start fighting with each other, you come to realize that this is no way to live, so you go your way, she goes her way, you're still married, but you make your own choices, and you ignore each other's wishes. I call all of those strategies win-lose strategies. And those are the common strategies in marriages today. They ultimately lead to the loss of love. They lost, you, you lose your romantic relationship, and in, mo in many cases, you get divorced. People look around and say, why should I be married yeah. when I, I, I can make my own choices now? If I try to live with somebody and make my own choices, he should get mad at me. Yeah. So I don't think I just I want to Win-win is the only way couples should negotiate in today's marriages. You must come to a win-win solution. Now, that's hard to do. Have you noticed in your marriage, in your short marriage, how hard it is to come to an enthusiastic agreement? Yeah. And all I'm saying is it's a skill set that unless you learn, you will not have a successful marriage. Yeah. So I've been training people how to, how to do what Joyce and I have been doing for 50 years. We've been married 50 years now, and we're happily married and we're in love. But we make our choices with each other in mind, and we make our choices together. So to answer your question quickly, um, what's happening to marriages today, and do we need them? Um, marriages are suffering terribly. People are getting divorced at unprecedented levels. And they are not marrying at unprecedented levels. In other words, they're staying single. We now here in America have a majority of single adults in America. Why marry? And here's my basic thesis. This is my basic uh, position. And that is men and women need each other. Yeah. They need each other. Women are just as smart as men but they have a different perspective than men. And if you can get a man and a woman to find an enthusiastic agreement, you come up with a wiser choice than what either one of them could have come up with. I think men and women are, are made to be together. They're made to be together physically, but they're also made to be together emotionally and mentally. And, and, but it's, it's much harder to do today than it was 100 years ago. So that's my answer. That's that's very helpful. So the the the, uh, the another small point that you that you kept mentioning in your book is that you said people come to people go to counselors too late. So I was just curious whether you feel that this is restricted to marriages alone, or is it just that we don't like seeking outside help? Say it again. I, you I, you were skipping. Ah, okay. So, I didn't so, hear all of so so you know I, this was a smaller question, but. You mentioned in your book that people go to counselors too late. Um, and I was just curious as to whether this is a phenomenon that you see only in marriages, or is it just a tendency that we are reluctant to seek help and that isn't sort of changing? What, what has your experience been? Um, you know, do you feel people are more open to counseling today than they were 10 years ago? The, the problem with marriage counseling is that there are so many bad marriage counselors out there. The, uh, in 1965, um, I read an article that said that only 25% of people who actually went to marriage counselors felt that the marriages did them any good. Wow. Only 25%. Yeah. And, and, and a, an equal amount, 25%, felt that the marriages actually, the counseling actually hurt their marriage. There was a 1995 consumer's report that was done where all of the uh, of all of the um, mental health counseling that's available, um, marriage counseling scored the least effective oh, wow. among the people that surveyed. Okay. So part of the problem is that most people that actually go to a marriage counselor don't get any help. Yeah. 
And then, and then they tell their friends that it really didn't help me. Yeah. Uh, that their parents went to a marriage counselor and ended up getting divorced. Yeah. So when they hear the, the advice that they should see a marriage counselor, they say, you know, marriage counselors can do more harm than good. Yeah. I'm not sure I can go. I don't know how this is going to turn out. So part of the reason that people don't see marriage counselors as often as they should is that the marriage counselors aren't very effective in helping them overcome their problems. Mm. Uh, what we do at Marriage Builders, which is an extremely important service, is we provide counseling without your having to see a counselor. Okay. We do this in a variety of ways. We have, if you come to the marriagebuilders.com website, you will see uh, a, a host of articles. You'll see Q&A columns. You'll see a forum where you can join in, discuss your problems. We have, Joyce and I have a daily radio show that we do, mm -hmm. um, all free of charge. Okay. So in a sense, you can sort of tip your toe in the water and kind of see how you feel about it before you actually commit yourself to going into a waiting room and sitting there wondering what the counselor is going to be doing with you. Yeah. So we have an approach to saving marriages that really doesn't commit anybody to anything. And by doing that, we're actually reaching millions of people. Yeah. I mean, millions and millions of people are being reached this way all over the world. We have people in Singapore uh, calling us and, and writing us on a regular basis. We have people from India. We have people from China. We have people from Africa. All over the world, reach, we reach because we don't require them to show. do anything but learn, but we want them to learn. That's it. It's kind of like what you're doing. You want people to learn. Okay, that's what we're all offering. Here is here is a learning experience in how to have a great marriage. Use your own judgment to see whether you think it's worthwhile, and it doesn't cost you anything to find out. That's very helpful. So now the next one is probably a trickier one. Is is fidelity or loyalty? Uh, wired in, in your experience, or is it a learned trait that we develop? I, I think we're all born to be unfaithful. Okay. We're all born to be unfaithful. And, and if, we, if we allow someone to meet our emotional needs yeah. of the opposite sex, we risk falling in love with that person. Okay. And if anybody of the opposite sex meets our emotional needs, we yeah. can fall in love. We can be in love with three people at once if all three people are meeting our emotional needs. Hmm. And what we find out a lot of times is that um, the person who has been unfaithful never thought it would happen to them. <laughs> they felt that their ethical values were strong enough to prevent them from, from actually yeah. getting involved with someone else. And we have worked with many people who are religious leaders, uh, people that are politicians that are very conservative, very pro-family. Uh, people that um, people that are CEOs of companies, where an affair would get them fired, and they have an affair, they have affairs, and the question is why? It's because our emotional response to someone meeting our emotional needs is so powerful that we're willing to destroy everything we've ever built to have that person in our lives. And it makes no sense logically, and it has destroyed a lot of people, but people are doing it every day. And it's a, it's a trait that I think has to do with procreation. Mm -hmm. I think we are all made to have babies. Yeah. And uh, we as men contribute to the having of babies by impregnating women, and women want to have babies. These are, this is all about what infidelity is about, as far as I'm concerned, from a, from a, from a, from a, procreation point of view. Yeah. And so we're all kind of motivated to have sex. And in order to avoid it, we've got to, what I, I use the term, we've got to protect our love bank from outside threats. <laughs> and the way you do that is you, you avoid people of the opposite sex coming in to meet your emotional needs. And if they meet your emotional need for, say, conversation or admiration or physical attractiveness, or a whole host of things, it, you can fall in love without ever thinking it'll happen to you. All it's one day you wake up craving this person, yeah. and and by that time 
you, your, your mind starts to think that this is what God had intended, that this is something that's natural. You go to your wife and say, how would you feel about this other person joining us in this marriage? Ridiculous ideas, but at the same time, this is something we think it would be logical because we get so emotionally entrapped. <laughs> so, so, so the next question then is, what do successful marriages in your experience repeatedly do right? What are a few, a few things that you always see? Well, here, there are three parts to a successful marriage, and you have to understand the overarching concept is you got to make love bank deposits and avoid love bank withdrawals. Yes. You've got to do things to make the other person happy, and you got to avoid things that make the other person unhappy. Yeah. There are three ways of doing that. Number one is you have to know what their emotional needs are, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to become an expert at meeting those needs. In other words, you have to be an expert at making your, your wife happy. Mm-hmm. So, so whatever it is makes her happy, chances are she will enjoy your being affectionate with her. She'll enjoy to, your talking to her, giving her your undivided attention. She will enjoy you being honest and open with her. She will enjoy you being a provider for her. And she'll enjoy that you are a good father to the children you're going to be having. All of that comes together so that she will be in love with you. You will make her very happy. Then you have to avoid making her unhappy. Yeah. And, and that is, the, the, these are categories that I call love busters. You, you, you can't make demands on her. You can't be disrespectful. You can't get ang angry with her. Uh, that, uh, not being angry with her is very tricky. Yeah. Don't ever be angry with her, okay? You can't, um, you can't uh, be dishonest with her. You can't annoy her. Now, the annoying thing is going to be next to impossible. Uh, basically, what, what, what she needs to do is tell you that something you're doing is annoying, and you got to take it seriously, and you got to try to stop doing it, even though at the time you're going to think, what? That annoyed you? you got to make sure that you get rid of whatever those things are. And the third, the last is independent behavior. You don't just go off and do what you please. You don't get over with her first. Make sure she's in agreement with you. Now, there's a third category, and that is lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle means that the, the lifestyle you build as a couple has to be something that's agreed upon by both of you enthusiastically. How many children you're going to have, where you're going to worship, what kind of a car you drive, um, when... When you see your in-laws, um, how you spend your money, all of these issues have to be agreed on together enthusiastically. Now, if you do those three things, I, I, the way I call it, I call it extraordinary care. Extraordinary care. Couples that give each other extraordinary care by meeting each other's emotional needs, avoiding love busters, and making decisions jointly that create a lifestyle that's pleasant for both of them, that is extraordinary care. And that results in romantic love that lasts for the rest of your lives together. That is super helpful. So, here, so you know, my next question was very much advice to new couples. Um, uh, but, but I guess it was very much around, are there any habits that you feel families benefit from? like dinners together, for example, are there any little habits that you've seen, you know, to help all of this kind of uh, from the background? This is before you have children? Uh, could be before and after. Uh, I mean, it would be good to get your kind of quick, quick view on both. I, I view those decisions yeah. as, as being uh, idiosyncratic. Okay. In other words, uh, having dinners with the in-laws is very, very helpful for some families and very destructive for others. Okay. And so, and, so, and, and I, again, I, I challenge a couple, a man and a woman, to come together yeah. on the decisions. Uh, are we going to have your folks over for dinner? Yeah. Or are we going to go for a bike ride instead? Yeah. You know, what, what are we going to, how are we going to handle these things? How are we going to handle your family? And, um, and as you know, uh, families, cultural requirements for families vary greatly over the, all over the Very world. Very true. 
Very true. You have you have some families where the parents are a huge factor yeah. in, in decisions that a couple makes. In other families, they are essentially ignored. Yeah. <laughs> and so, again, what I say is that the husband and the wife, whatever they do, have to come to an agreement on it before they do it. And they should not have a win-lose agreement where one guy just puts up with the other guys wanting their mom over all the time. Yeah. And they don't really like their mom that much. So that basically they decide how they're going to handle this in a way that works for both of them. And that is, see, that's why I don't give a whole lot of advice on specifics. I give my advice more on Principles. whatever it is you do, yeah. come to an agreement on it before you do it. And then that way, the two of you will be very happy together and you will, and you'll be in love. Fantastic. So we're getting the last kind of quick sets of questions. So this is kind of on your, uh, more about you. What is, what is a favorite book, Dr. Harley? What is, what is a book that you enjoy reading or a few books? <laughs> well, let's see. Right now, I, I have several areas of interest. Yeah. One is geology. Yeah. Okay. Geology. I love the history of the earth. Okay. I like to. Uh, there, there is a very interesting geology book. Uh, geology Illustrated is the name of the book, okay. and it was published in the in the nineteen sixties. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, it's still the best book on geology, and I can't remember the name of the author right now, but it's called Geology Illustrated. Okay. Another area that I read a lot on is archaeology. Okay. <clears throat> I love archaeology, and I love human history. Okay. I read a lot of history books right now. I am into British history. Okay. And I am studying the kings between... Um, William the Conqueror and Henry VIII. Okay. So that's the period that I'm studying right now. I am also interested in biblical history. Okay. I'm a Christian, and so I have studied um, the Bible, and I've been to Israel, I've been to Jordan, I've, I've done archaeological kinds of interests, I've done archaeological... I never read fiction. Okay. <laughs> I never read fiction. I am always reading facts. I always want to learn. I want to learn something that I've never seen before or done before. That's the kind of person I am. So, so, so no movies uh, or, or, or TV series that you enjoy, or are they typically of the <laughs> you know the planet Earth, you know the David Attenborough kind? Yeah, I do, and um, um, I I like the uh, I. I I love the Science Channel, yeah, and and I watch that a great deal. Um, I love Game of Thrones. Ah, perfect! Another Game fan of is wonderful, <laughs> and there's a new series to, that just started this week called um, the White Queen. Okay, the White Queen, and it's the period just before Henry VIII. Okay, and it's a period that I'm very interested in, and. Um, that's a good. That's a good series too. Uh, last night I watched. Um, um, uh, Gone Bad. What's the name of it? Breaking it's, Bad. Uh, uh, Breaking Bad. I watched that last night. <laughs> and and wh why do you like the Game of Thrones? First of all, the acting is absolutely superb. Yeah. Uh, the writer, the writer, uh, the original writer, the guy that writes this stuff, what they're upset about is that he's not writing faster. Yes. Because they want to get more of these things out because yes. they've become so popular. But yes. the actors are superb. The the script is superb, and the context, the the you know, they go all over the world to film this stuff, mm -hmm. and that is all superb. It's just incredibly creative, just yeah. very creative. Fantastic. So the, uh, com coming to my final two questions. One is, you, you've published 18 books, probably a book a year, and you're obviously counseling and running, you know, a business in a way and yet, you know, helping people. How, wh what do you do to stay productive? And what are some little habits of yours or routines of yours that help you stay productive, energized, happy? I would say that my marriage and my faith are the two most important parts of my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe that that my uh, my very good relationship with God is a great 
source of strength. Mm -hmm. My great relationship with my wife is a great source of strength. Uh, those are the two things that bring us happiness in life, yeah. our marriage and our faith. And um, if I counted on anything else to give me happiness, I would be disappointed. <laughs> so I would say that I, I gain a great deal of strength from, from God. I gain a great deal of strength from my wife. And um, as a result, I'm also healthy. I'm, I'm over 70, and I'm very healthy. And as long as I am healthy and my brain is functioning properly, I will probably be doing this for the rest of my life. Fantastic. So the final one would be, is there uh, an inspirational quote, message, or some, you know, something that inspires you that you would like to share? Well, first of all, I want to let, you know, I would like your, your, your viewers know <clears throat> that I am a born-again Christian. Yeah. I do believe in, in God, and my relationship with him is through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. Mm -hmm. I also believe that the message of Christianity is love. Jesus says that they, they will know you by your love. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. And that's what he told his disciples. We, we are identified as a, belief, as a faith yeah. by the way we love each other. Yeah. Uh, those who don't love each other aren't following the Christian faith. Yeah. Uh, there was a period of time in medieval history where people were being killed uh, because of religious reasons. Uh, true Christianity doesn't believe in any of that. That's a false Christianity. Yeah. And I believe that if, if, if you know a Christian well, and he's a born-again Christian, you'll know that that person cares about other people yeah. and will put himself out for other people. And I think that the most important and most valuable lesson we can learn in life is thoughtfulness, is concerning, considering other people before we do things trying to make sure that we are a, a, a messenger of help and support for people who need it. And I think that when you learn that lesson, you go through life joyfully. It's, life is a joyous experience. If you, if you don't learn that lesson and, you, and you, all you care about is yourself, uh, you become very depressed and miserable and you find that, you know, you wonder what life is really all about. Well, you've missed the boat because life is all about caring for each other. Uh, that's very, very lovely message, Dr. Harley. Thank you so much.